Hey, how's it going? I'm Chris with Diva W Airstream, and this is your 2016 Eddie Bauer 27 foot. We're going to start right here in the front with this front solar guard. We're going to lift this up, reach up on either side to level this out. That's going to allow us to open this front window. Of course, this front window does open outward and it is blocked by this solar guard, so you will need to open the solar guard first. All the rest of the windows in the Trevo that open aren't blocked by anything, so you will be able to just open them from the inside. Also going to allow you to open these side solar guards. Now, there is a rubber gasket here, but over time, leaves and dirt will get past that, and the window behind there would get dirty, so if you wanted to clean that window, the screw here and here has a T-shaped head, so you'll just give it a quarter turn. It will come out of this channel here and it's going to hinge away from the trailer on either side. Please make sure when you do so that you've got a hold of the window. If the wind grabs it and slams it open, there's not a stop and it could put a crease in the side of your trailer. We'll move over here and talk about your front storage compartment. Being a used trailer, this one is going to have some previous items left in here from the previous owner. The one thing I want to mention is the light over here on the side. Now that light's gonna go out when you hit the master battery disconnect. I will recommend that you go ahead and turn it off so that way when you turn the disconnect back on, it's not a large surge of electricity. Battery boxes here. This morning I put brand new SRM batteries in here. These batteries are gonna require a liquid maintenance. Every 30 to 90 days, you're gonna to wanna to check the distilled water level under these caps here, here, and here. Every 30 days if you're storing the unit and every 90 days if you're using the unit. <clears throat> Basically, the more you store it with it plugged in, the more heat that's created that's causing the water in there to boil off. So you'll need to check that water level more frequently when you're doing so. Next to that is gonna be your spare tire. There's a cotter pin here that's holding a slide pin. Pull those, that handle's gonna drop down. Your spare will slide out this direction. It's gonna be 65 PSI on your spare tire, just like your road tires. Propane services here, you have two 30 pound propane bottles. They are both full. In between is an automatic regulator. <clears throat> so if you're running both bottles open, when you run one empty, we'll automatically switch over to the other bottle. You can point this little post at one bottle or another if that is the bottle that you would prefer that it pulled from. Provided from that bottle is open, it will pull from that bottle. Because there is no gauge, I am gonna recommend you run one bottle closed and run one bottle open. So when you run this one empty, you have to physically come out here and open this other bottle. So now you know you're running off of that second bottle. You can be a little more conservative with your propane and start thinking about getting that first bottle filled up. <clears throat> we'll leave this one open for now so that we can test a few things on the inside. I also wanted to point out there is an external LP port right over here. It is a pre-regulated 25,000 BTU service. It's going to be good for running a little camping stove or maybe even a little space heater. Come around the corner here with me. We've got your gross vehicle weight and tire pressure sticker here. Again, it's 80 PSI on your tires, not 65, I'm sorry. This stud here and its friend down there at the end will drop your stabilizer jacks. You do have an independent stabilizer jack control for each corner of the trailer. Storage for your sewer line is here. This tube is going to hold a collapsible 15-foot sewer hose, and there's one already in there for you. Outdoor shower is here. Now, if you're using this with the onboard water tank to get pressure here, you'll need to turn on the onboard water pump. The city water connection pressurizes the entire trailer. The city water, I'm sorry, the outdoor shower as well. This wand is made of plastic, so when you winterize the trailer, I will recommend that you disconnect it and drain it. That way, it doesn't crack. I have seen a lot of this come back with the crack in them. Next to that is going to be the fill port for your onboard water tank. This is simply a gravity fill port, so you'll stick your water hose in here and fill it on up. I'm going to show you how you can set up the water monitor so that you can look in the window and watch the status of the tank as you fill and empty it. But if you lose track of this, it will not overfill inside the trailer. There's a little vent tube right there and it'll come out of that. Next is going to be your city water connection. This is where you'll connect your water hose at your camping site for your on-demand water. 
This city water connection has a built-in 50 PSI regulator. So do not add an external water regulator. You won't get any water pre pressure passing through. But it is also plumbed through the onboard water pump. So if the site you're staying at has weak water pressure, you can turn on the onboard pump and it will boost the pressure at the faucets, but you do not fill the fresh water tank through this port. In fact, the fresh water tank and the city water connection are completely separate. You don't actually need any water in your fresh tank to operate with a city water connection. And I also want to mention that you want to make sure you're cycling through the water in your fresh water tank every two weeks. After two weeks, the water will start to taste a little stale. And if you store it in the summertime, that water will start to smell like feet. So just go ahead and make sure you drain it. The drain for the fresh water tank is back here between these two tires. There's a little white pet cock right there. Turn the flag at the top towards the rear of the trailer and it will slowly drain out the bottom. Below your city water connection is gonna be your waste tank clean out valve. So when you attach your water line here, it's gonna put water directly into the black waste tank, which is where the toilet empties. It's designed to help you clean that out. Your waste clean out is down below. Now there is a light in case you need to connect at night. Sewer line goes here in the middle and on the left hand side, the main holding tank is your black tank. And on the right hand side, the auxiliary tank is your gray tank. It also says wash here to help you remember. You always begin with the main tank. Before you pull this valve the first time, I want you to attach your water line to the waste tank clean out valve and start to introduce fresh water. Because this is a gravity drain, you're gonna need the maximum volume of water to help push all that solid waste out. So I want you to fill it all the way up to the top before you pull that valve the first time. You'll notice the water comes out of that port much faster than you can get it back in here. So when you see the flow diminish, close the water, close the valve, continue to allow it to fill back up to the top with fresh water. You're gonna flush this tank out five or six times until it goes from pretty muddy to pretty clear. Once it's as clean as you can stand, close the valve and continue to allow water to backfill until it reads about 5% on the waste gauge. Then you can go inside and throw your tank chemical into the toilet and there'll be water inside the tank to help that dissolve and diffuse. Come back outside and do your gray tank second. That is gonna be mostly soapy water from your, city, from your sinks and showers. It's gonna help wash this pipe out. Do not open both valves at the same time. If you do, the black tank will flow into the gray tank and contaminate it. Do not leave your valves open at your camping site. Were you to leave the black valve open, the water that you need to catch the things that you're putting in the toilet is gonna to run out. When those things fall to the bottom of that tank, they're gonna dry out and they're gonna smell. Less important for the gray tank, but if you were to leave that valve open, insects or rodents could crawl up inside there and build a nest in your onboard tank. So it's fine to leave your sewer line attached if you have the ability to do so, but keep the valves shut until you're actually empty in the waste. Of course, heading back this direction, we've got a cable and satellite port. They are labeled and they will terminate in different places inside the trailer. So when we get inside there, we'll talk a little more about that. Camp power comes in here. It's a 50 amp service at 110 volts. This is actually your short cord. It is 20 feet long. This port here will be refrigerator access. This allows us to work on the refrigerator without actually having to go inside and pull the refrigerator out. Do not be tempted to use this for storage. It needs the air space to operate correctly and anything you stow inside there will bounce around and damage those electrics as you tow. All right, this is gonna be the exhaust for your furnace. And moving past that, we have another exhaust vent because this trailer has a hatch in the back and it's designed to possibly carry a motorsports vehicle, something with gas in it, there are two vents like this to vent those gasoline fumes. We'll find another one inside in the bedroom. Of course, around the back, <clears throat> we have your hatch. Latches here. We'll go ahead and unlatch that and then we'll simply lift it up. I'm gonna have you kind of stand back here and I'm gonna fold this bench up so that they can see how to fold the benches okay. up. I wanna point out that there is a bug screen that can be pulled down right here. And I'm gonna go inside and I'm gonna fold up this bench so that we can watch that. Now, <clears throat> these are not the factory cushions that come with these folding benches. So because they're twice as thick as normal, you will actually have to remove the cushions to get the benches to fold up. It's 
just like so. Of course, you'll note we've got D-ring tie downs below and of course your subwoofer is hidden back here as well. On the other side, just the same. Pull the cushion out of the way. This is how it looks when you have it all set up. Also note on the roadside bench underneath is that vent that I was talking about right back here against the wall. Let's go ahead and close this. Of course, you want to make sure you resecure it. And then below that, we have your bumper or your trunk storage. In here, we have a few more items, including an extra sewer line and a water line. The storage compartment back here, unlike the one in the front, is not considered secure or dry. When this one is closed, it's actually going to still be open here on the ends. And these little tabs are all that's holding it shut. So don't put anything in there that you're worried about getting wet. We'll come around the corner here. And before we head to the water heater, I will point out that there was some extra bedding that came with this trailer that's going to be included with it as well. <clears throat> Up here we have your water heater. This water heater has an electric and a gas element for heat in a six gallon capacity. When you drain or winterize the water heater, make sure that you relieve the pressure here before you pull the drain plug so that way you're not blasted with what could potentially be scalding water. It's a 24 millimeter drain plug. I'll pull that and set it aside and disable the system by pulling this connector here. That way you cannot actually turn it back on from the inside without having water in it. Were you to do so, the electrical element will burn itself up and so will the propane element. Go ahead and plug these back in. And we'll close this booger back up. Dual 110 plug right here. This is just your standard 15 amp 110, only available when you're plugged into your short circuit. One more thing over here is going to be the vent hood. Now there are two little tabs holding these doors shut. You want to push those up and out of the way to allow this to vent. But use these tabs when you're towing. They're going to help hold this door shut. This door is made of plastic and over time could possibly flap itself into pieces. Step here is very simple. You'll fold the lower step onto the upper step and then you'll just tuck the, t the pair together just like so. And then, of course, your main door here. These doors were built in pairs, and they were designed to be closed in pairs. So you don't want to slam the main door onto the screen door when the screen door is closed. Make sure that you have them secured together first, and then give them that push to get it shut. So this is how you'll fold out the awning on the side. You do have a travel latch here that you want to make sure you disengage first. And then we'll come over here to the ones on the ends and we'll unscrew these. Come down here to the other end. Now, when you go to pull the awning out, it's very important that you pull away from the trailer and not straight down so you don't scratch the side with your awning tool. Grab the strap here, pull away and pull the strap to you. Continue to pull it out until the flap drops out. We'll come down here to the end. 
grab the arm and place it up here on the head. Always place it here and never here. If you put it here, it's gonna bend right there and it's gonna break. Once we've got it up here, we will spear it forward to lock it in place. Come down here to the other end. At this point, we can start to extend it. Now you've got four of these little notches and you can do two at a time. I will typically start with one. I'll come down here and do a couple of them. And then we'll come back to the other end and finish it off. Now you'll notice how I've got your awning at an angle. This awning is a sun shade. So if you have more sunlight coming in from one direction or another, having it at an angle is totally appropriate. It is not a heavy wind or a heavy rain shade. It's made of aluminum. It's designed to be lightweight. It cannot take the torque of a heavy wind. And of course, heavy winds always accompany a heavy rain. So if it starts to blow or pour, make sure you fold it back in. Your strap here is gonna roll up. and eventually tuck into this loop here. Putting it away is just the reverse of bringing it back out. So we'll come down here to the end. We'll drop a couple of notches. You don't want to do more than two to prevent this from binding. You're gonna pull here to release. And you're gonna set the arm on the travel rest. All you do is set it in place. You do not need to lock it. We'll come down to this end and we'll drop this last notch. Make sure when you pull to release that you've got a hold of it so it doesn't come slamming in on its own. Place this on the travel rest. And I'll either hold onto the flap or I'll put my hand up here until I can get down to the strap. Give it a little help. And if you need to, you can use the awning tool to return it. You'll run it to right about there. Let it snap in those last couple inches so it's nice and tight and it doesn't wrinkle. Please make sure you remember to re-engage your travel latches. down here and So you can see how much fun that was. Down here on this end, there's no harm in standing in the doorway and just using your hands. There you go. <clears throat> now, if you'll follow me inside, we do have a fire extinguisher right here by the door. This is your master battery disconnect. So when you're storing the trailer, turn this off and pull the shore power and it will disable every battery item. Above that, two switches here. One's gonna be for the overhead door light right above the entry door. And the other one's gonna be for the cabinet light over the dinette. The awning light here, LED light strip on a dimmer, as well as the ceiling lights. You'll need to stow the table lid when you're towing. This one does not tow very well. I like to stow it right here under this bench. Around the corner here, we've got your radio. 
Now this radio can be paired with your phone. The code for so is going to be M303. And you'll be able to use your telephone through that as well, and that's why we have this microphone up here. In here we have your DVD and Blu-ray player. Behind this box is going to be the termination port point for the satellite port on the side of the trailer. So coming out of the wall here behind here is a coax for your signal in and also an HDMI cable and a splitter box. That is designed so you to semi-permanently mount your receiver here, plug it into that splitter box and it will appear on the HDMI 1 slot on the TVs which is currently where you'll find the DVD player. Around here we have your sea level monitor. This is going to tell you your battery voltage. That is 13.4 volts and also your water tank levels. So your fresh tank is 38% full, the gray tank is empty, and the black tank is 55% full. When you press the button on any of the water tanks twice, this little red dot is going to hold the value on the screen for about five minutes. So when you're filling and emptying the tanks, you can watch the status through the window. Also here is the power for your onboard water pump. This is an on-demand water pump, so it's going to pressure up and stop and it will not come back on again until you create a demand. Pressures up and stops. It's not actually drawing any power until you're running water through it. Of course, if you're connected to your city water connection, you do not need to have that on, but you can turn it on if the pressure is weak and it will help boost that pressure at your faucets. Of course, these switches here are going to be for the galley and the one next to that is the galley cabinet. Inverter control here. It's a 1000 watt sine wave inverter. It's going to allow you to run your TVs and your DVD player off of the battery circuit. Of course your vent hood has a light as well as a vent. And below that we have your oven and range. Now we're going to turn them all on and click them for a few minutes to get the gas to flow. There we go. Now, if you've been cooking on these and they're nice and hot, be careful when you close this lid, that heat will transfer through this metal lid. Also make sure that you tow with the lid down. If you leave it back in the raised position, these little tabs that act like hinges will break off. The oven below is gonna have to be lit with a kitchen match or a long lighter. The place for the pilot light is right behind this little silver plate. And then after you get the pilot lit, you'll be able to use it just like a regular oven. Over here on the other side, we have your refrigerator. This refrigerator has an on-off switch, an auto gas switch, and a temperature set. Five is the coldest. One would, of course, be the warmest. When it's in auto, as it is now, it's going to pull from the 110 power first. If it fails to detect 110 power, we'll automatically switch over to the propane. You can force that by pressing this button here. We'll do so. The little dot's going to move over. It's going to click a few times until it clears the air out of the lines, and then it will just kind of work. Were it to fail to light off of propane, you will get a warning up here. It will flash LP at you. If you see that, you'll need to turn the unit off and then turn it back on to get that to reset. It's going to take seven or eight hours for this unit to get completely cold. We are going to recommend that you plug it into your 110 power and get it cold overnight. Whatever food you're going to put inside, get that food cold before you put it in there. If you put cold food in a cold refrigerator and close the door, as long as you leave the door shut, it will stay cold in there for seven or eight hours without an external power source. It's currently running off propane now, so we're going to switch it back over to the 110 power and we're going to turn it off. Moving a little further back, main hanging storage is here. Um, there was a backpack that came with this that is still in here and then we have the storage for your table legs down below. All right. <clears throat> of course all the way down at the bottom your propane detector is hardwired into the batteries so you don't need to worry about changing batteries on that one. Shower door here is made of glass. This little retainer tab is keeping that shut while you tow. Were this to fly open going down the road, it could possibly shatter. This little tab can be actuated from the inside of the shower, so that way if you turn and bump the door with your elbow, you won't knock the door open and spill a bunch of water on the floor. 
I do recommend that you tow with your drain plug in. We've got a little clothesline here that can be stretched across and tightened down. It's going to be good for your bathing suits or your dish towels, but no bath towels. Manual vent fan here on the ceiling. Pushes open. Little red button turns it on. Pull it closed. Shower head here does have a pause feature, so you can pause that hot water as you're soaping up and kind of conserve it a little bit. Of course, the light switch is on the outside there. If you'll step past me, go over to the bathroom next. All right, in the bathroom, of course, you've got your sink and your toilet back here. The water heater control is here on the wall. There's an electrical element and a gas element. They can be run simultaneously. It's going to take 30 to 45 minutes for the, to heat on gas, hour and a half to two hours on the electric. I'm not sure if you can hear it from in here, but there is a little jet engine sound that that gas makes, and it's burning right now. They can be run simultaneously. It's going to help them recover a little faster. Of course, the toilet here with the water pump on or your city water connected, a partial step on this lever is going to fill that bowl. Full step flushes. You do add your tank chemical straight down into the toilet. One other thing I will recommend, I'm going to walk over here and turn your water pump off. Turn the water pump off and disconnect the city water connection before you tow out and stand here on the toilet for just a moment to relieve the pressure on the water lines. You also don't want to tow with a bowl full of water here so that way it doesn't slosh around. It only takes just a moment. All right, we'll head out of here. Now you asked, so up here, I was told that these are for hanging clothes. Um, they can be used with the ones on the other side and little bungee cords can be stretched across um, to hang various items, but clothes was what they were supposedly used originally for. This bed is going to lift up to provide access to some of that storage underneath there. It also holds itself up. Gotta love this beautiful yellow comforter. That one's just for you, Brian. Of course, your TV is on a travel bracket just like the other one. Please make sure that you have it secured to the wall before you tow out. Cabinet lights and then the overheads are on a dimmer just like the rest of the trailer. Finally, we have the HVAC control. Here, why don't you switch me spots? So with the HVAC control, when it's dark, the first press of any button is simply going to turn the backlight on. Press it again to actually get the control panel to turn on. You'll end up pressing these buttons twice in a lot of situations. Zone one is going to be the bedroom and zone two will be the rest of the trailer. By mode, the first option is going to be the air conditioner. Now in these trailers, the air conditioner does not fire up immediately. It's gonna take just a few moments for it to charge the capacitors. It's also looking to make sure that it has the right voltage. This little hourglass indicates that it's working. Typically the fan will come on first and the compressor will come on whenever the hourglass goes on, usually within about 30 seconds of the fan coming on. All right, so there goes the compressor. Notice at the bottom we have a fan symbol and it says auto. That is your speed control. You do have a three speed fan, so we'll turn it down to low. It's gonna take just a moment for it to slow down. However, leave it in auto as the default so that way when you turn the control panel on, the fan doesn't come on immediately. By mode, we have another auto here at the top. The auto at the top will automatically switch between the air conditioner and the heat pump depending on your ambient temperature and whatever you have it set for here. The next option is the heat pump. It does make a little squishy sound as it switches over. Now, the heat pump is gonna operate down to about 50 degrees ambient temperature. After that, you're gonna to wanna to switch over to the furnace, but the furnace is found on zone two. So we'll cycle through back to the air conditioner Actually, what I'll do in this instance is I'll go ahead and cycle all the way through to off, switch zones, and we'll turn this air conditioner on. Now, if I had left that other air conditioner running and we were plugged into a 30 amp service, the other air conditioner is gonna act like it wants to come on, 
but with one air conditioner already running, it's not providing enough power on 30 amp, the other air conditioner simply will not come on. So it's not gonna allow you to harm it. But just like the zone one air conditioner, it's still gonna take just a few minutes for it to fire up. There goes the fan. We're still waiting for the compressor to kick in. All right, there it goes. So same options by mode, the auto, the heat pump. And then after the heat pump is going to be the furnace. Now the furnace is going to disable the overhead and it's going to come on down below by itself. Of course, the furnace runs on propane. And even though it's controlled through this panel, the furnace will operate off of just the batteries, whereas the air conditioners and the heat pumps require you to be plugged into a shore service. After the furnace, we've got the fan by itself and then off. You want to make sure that both zones are off before you turn the control panel off, so that way when you turn the control panel back on, it's not a big surge of electricity coming back on. Also, when you turn the control panel off after, being used, after having used the furnace, the furnace will continue to run for about two minutes. There is a cool down cycle that you need to allow to complete. One final thing I want to mention in the bedroom is that there is another vent up here on the roof, just like in the rear end of the trailer to help vent those fumes if you're storing some kind of a gasoline vehicle. We'll go ahead and turn these lights out and head back to the front. Finally, I want to talk about your fantastic exhaust fan. This is a fully functional fan. We're going to turn it completely off. Lid switch is here. However, nothing happens until we select a speed here. So we'll put it on one. And now the lid switch is going to go ahead and open. Fan is turned on here. This is a crude thermostat. So in between these clicks, when the temperature crosses that threshold, it will turn itself off and on. Also has the rain sensor. So if it gathers enough moisture, it's going to close on its own. And when it does, it will shut itself off. Please remember that the lid is made of plastic, so you do not want to tow with that one open, which is also why they provide those other vents. Thank you for your time. This concludes your walkthrough on your Eddie Bauer. Thanks for watching our video. If you have any questions or have any recommendations on content you'd like to see, make sure to drop a comment in the comment section below. If you enjoy our content, give us a like and be sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks again from Airstream ADFW.